Hey everybody, hey outlets, hey witches, hey pagans, hey everybody else. My name's Nathan, AKA Blue Knight. I go by Blue Knight to my public pagan circles. Actually, most of my public circles know me as Blue Knight, I think in some way. I have been practicing witchcraft since 2004, so however many years that is. And there's a reason why I'm, I'm opening this video like this. Sorry, you have to see my hair dry. I've been irritated. <laughs> aggravated, irritated lately on some of people's advice to beginner witches. This is stemming from TikTok and also other forms of social media that everybody gets their nice little fingers on. I realize I have not made a video specifically for my advice to newcomers to the craft or people who may think they want to start studying to be a witch or practicing witchcraft or studying a pagan religion, what have you. So I thought I would make one. I know I made some resources clear in one of my videos before about how I got started, but again, I wanna make a video explicitly for my advice for beginner witches. So let me start off by saying my background. I am not initiated into any particular sect of Wicca or any traditional coven of any kind. You're probably gonna hear noises from the dog. She is playing with her teddy bear right now, but I am not <clears throat> by any means an initiate of any tradition. With that being said, you can take what I have to say and be responsible enough to decide whether or not any of this pertains to you. So, the first thing I wanna say is that I know of two different paths you can take to start your study of witchcraft, paganism, Wicca. The first path that I would say is the traditional path would be to find a coven see if that coven is willing to work with you, and then start with the coven, start working with the coven as a future initiate, and do a year and a day study, which is exactly what it sounds like. You study for a year and a day. You study Wicca, witchcraft, that coven's traditions. After that year and a day, you have an initiation into that coven if you so, if you still choose to do so. And then you would be considered to some covens, a witch at that point. It depends on the coven. I say traditional because Wicca is a forerunner for public witchcraft as we know it. Back in the good old days, <laughs> witchcraft was kept secret. There were still laws against the practice of witchcraft, including in the States. So a lot of people who would consider themselves witches were very secretive about it. With that being said, nobody really came out and said, I am a witch. You know, there were studies based off of witches and there were obviously uh, outsiders, if you will, writing about specific covens and practices, but nobody from a practice, at least to my knowledge, I could be wrong, but nobody from the inside of a working coven or a practice or what have you ever really came out and said, I'm a witch and this is what we do until Gerald Gardner. And 
Gerald was of a particular tradition and he formed his own tradition, which is what the public now recognizes as Wicca. Shortly after Gerald Gardner came out of the broom closet, if you will, Raymond Buckland also learned of Gerald Gardner's practice and brought it to the States. And that was in what, the 60s, 70s, something like that. So that would be how you would practice the traditional way. And of course that path, as far as finding a coven, that also works for closed practices. If you have ancestry or lineage from a closed practice and you feel like you want to learn from that, you would have to learn that way. That's why they call them closed practices. To me, there are traditions of Wicca that are closed because you have to be welcomed into that community or into that culture or that practice in order to learn it and practice it. So that's one way you could become a witch and it's a good way. The other way is the way that I personally took, I'm sure you're probably already guessing, is by self-study, solitary practice. I think most of witches nowadays really learn, I think is this other way, which is self-study, self-discipline. <sighs> My advice is going to be pertained to this path of study, because that's what I'm more familiar with. Again, a little bit on my background. I have practiced since 2004. I'm not going to do the math because math is like right now. Good morning. <laughs> but I've been practicing since 2004, but that doesn't mean I'm a pro. I don't know everything. I'm consistently learning from other people and from the spirits and the guides and the gods that I work with. I'm constantly learning shit on my own. So if you ask me what type of witch I am, as far as what my tradition is, I would say that I am a pagan eclectic witch. I would also say I mostly pull from Wiccan sources. Mostly I just practice like Appalachian granny magic because that's what I grew up to know. So that's what I do. I do try and learn as much as I can about Irish mythology simply because the Morrigan and Dagda, the Dagda, are my matron and patron. They come from an Irish pantheon, so I try and study up on language and their stories. They came to me before I knew anything about their stories. So it's been interesting. It's been an interesting journey. I consider myself very much eclectic. With that being said, when anybody ever comes to me and says that they want to start studying to be a witch or they want to become a witch or learn how to be a pagan, and people have come to me in the past, I always start by suggesting Wiccan resources. Now, I don't consider myself a Wiccan, but Wicca to me is a very good platform to start from. And there's a reason for this. There are things that I don't really like about Wicca, but we can give Wicca its props for being a foundation setter and also for being a good foundation. It is a good, sturdy practice. So a lot of witches, you know, some of you may have seen on social media, they like to joke and say that Wicca is the Catholicism of witchcraft. There's a little bit of high magic in there, a lot of ritual. There's tools that you use very specifically that have to look a specific way. So I usually recommend people start out with Scott Cunningham, really anything he writes I love. I know there's a little bit of controversy as far as some of the uh, herbal mixes and, and, and recipes that he uses. Be wary of those. This is a good little point for me to just say, no matter what you read or hear or study, before you insert it into your practice, you need to do your research and not just like check your work. Honestly, check your work multiple times because in some instances books that were written in the good old days may not have the same background or scientific knowledge as we do today so you know with scott cunningham's herbal mixtures and and, and recipes and such harper honey root we now know that some of those are poisonous 
So obviously, especially when it comes to herbs and, you know, mixes and everything, if you're gonna burn it or if you're gonna place it on your body or God forbid, eat it, make sure you do all of the research that you can and even consult a professional, <laughs> a professional witch or herbologist or botanist. Make sure you consult them before you obviously do said things with herbs and crystals. Crystals are a big one too. There's a lot of crystals that react differently to different things. So make sure you do your research. But with that being said, I still like to recommend Scott Cunningham because he is a very uh, open author. It's very informational to read his, his work, but it's also very easy to just pick up. Very professional, but also very enlightening and pleasure to read. So the first book that I would recommend, and obviously I'm going to say books and everything else, because this is what you have to do. You have to study. This is a craft, and to get better at a craft, you practice and you study. So the first book that I would recommend if you're going down the solitary route is Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner. I'll probably put it right here so you know what it looks like. It's a very good read. It teaches you a really good amount of the basics including some uh, dedication, consecration rituals for your tools, what tools to use, how to use them. Uh, he explains a little bit of history as far as gardenarian stuff goes, all that stuff, pretty good. Once you kind of get the hang of that and got that down pat and you've got your notes, I would recommend the sequel to that book, Living Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner. It's very repetitive, I will say that, as far as repeating stuff from the first book. But he also adds a little bit more in there, especially when it comes to good, what I would say are beginner-friendly spells. Because you don't have to be a witch to practice spell work, and obviously that's, that's what everybody wants to do. They want to cast the spells, man, you know? So those, both of those books, I believe, have really good foundational information and good beginner-friendly spells that are almost foolproof, I would say. So I would definitely um, suggest those books. As far as other spells that you would want to do after you read those books, another two of my favorites are Earth Power and Earth Wind Fire earth air fire water earth air fire water are also both written by scott cunningham and really good just plain spell books and you don't need any you really don't need any tools for any of those really i think they're all very simple mostly folk magic spells aside from scott cunningham once you're done with those books the next step I would take would be to get, I, I love that this book is known by pretty much everybody, I think everybody in the pagan community or witchy community anyway. I would recommend Raymond Buckland's writings um, specifically, so it's called Raymond Buckland's Complete Book of Witchcraft. and. I'll put it right here. There's a lot of nicknames for this book and a lot of people call it the Big Blue Book. A lot of people call it the Blue Book of Witchcraft or Big Blue or Bucky's Big Blue Book. But I would highly recommend that one because it's going to give you an example. So whereas Scott, Scott's writing is very open and very, you know, oh, form your own tradition and it's very solitary. Raymond's is very different. Like it's open for solitary practitioners as well, but it also has a lot of coven craft information in it. If you have to leave the circle, traditional ways to do that. A lot of metaphysics are in there, history, theory it's and it's built like a textbook so 
This book I, I recommend after Scott Cunningham's books because it's a little more cut and dry. There are, however, exercises in the book as well as journal entries. Now, at this point, if you're getting into this and you're, if you're writing down these titles or adding these titles to your Amazon list or what have you, I would also highly recommend that you start a journal now. Journaling sucks. I hate journaling. <laughs> so this journal, the purpose of this journal is to be either your book of shadows or your book of mirrors, book of reflections, whatever you want to call it. I personally have a book of shadows or a grimoire. It's basically the same thing. Most people call, say grimoires are just information, which is what my book of shadows is. And I have a book of mirrors or a book of reflections or a journal, which is basically like a pre book of shadows, book of shadows. But the purpose of this is to take notes. That's all I want you to do in this journal is take notes, do the journal entries and the exercises, take note of what your ex experiences are with said exercises uh, in at least Buckland's book if not also Scott Cunningham's books. Because this will be, like I said, a good start to a book of shadows. Now, does it have to be organized? Does it have to be, you know, super informational? No, you could just write down whatever sticks out to you. I want you to start this so that way it's easier to transfer information, I guess. I Just trust me, you'll love it. It'll be helpful. After you finish Buckland's book, and I believe he recommends that uh, even people who have been well-versed into witchcraft, I think he recommends that you read the book at least like once every two years or four years or something. I used to do that. I kind of dropped the ball on that because there's only so many times you can read a book. I'm sorry. That's just me. After you move on from that book, there's also online resources. There is still a website called paganspath.com. I believe the person who created this website is a witch of Wiccan discipline, I believe, but she has a lot of resources on there as far as Celtic and metaphysical and just different articles. In fact, when I first started, reading. There's two articles that I've always found really interesting, and that is an article for adolescents who are interested in studying Wicca or the craft, and also an article for parents whose adolescents want to study the craft. I think her, she did a really good job at writing those articles, and I highly recommend those if you are either of those people. Definitely check out Pagan's Path. Also, of course, YouTube. You know, there's a lot of YouTube resources out there. The Lady Grave Dancer is a good resource. I've followed her for a while. There's a lot of YouTubers that are just not around as much anymore. I think Sunshine Morning Ray also has some of her videos up. I've followed her for years now as well. Ravenflower, she has a lot of good herbalism on her channel. I'm not sure if she's done. It's been a while since she started as well. So I'm trying to remember if she's done like a beginner type of video, but I know that she's been making videos since she began studying and practicing. So that's pretty cool. Or at least picked it back up and then she started making videos. So that's pretty cool. Huge advice I want to give you though. And this is where we get into nitty gritty. So it's cool to be on witch talk or TikTok. Yes, there are a lot of pagan and witch creators on witch talk. And there's a lot of good information on witch talk. But I want you to use that as a last resource. So let's say you're on witch talk and you see somebody say, you could do this or you, this is this. I want you to really do some research. After you start doing research, find 
people who are willing to communicate with you, I would be more than happy to be one of those people who's willing to answer your questions because there's a lot of bullshit out there and a lot of people out there who will bullshit you. There are people out there who are ill intent, especially on witch talk. One term that I really hate that has become super popular, it almost became a big thing on YouTube there for a while. One huge thing that just blew up on TikTok is the term baby witch. And if you take anything from this video, please don't call yourself a baby witch because it's, it's not what you think it is. It's not cute. It's degrading. It's a way for people to gatekeep in a sense. There are times when gatekeeping is appropriate, such as, you know, closed practices and stuff like that. Anyway, before I get into a rant, use what you learn from TikTok as a last advantage. Like, take that information as a last resort. Always do your research. If you're scrolling through TikTok and you see somebody giving you information, make sure, you, again, you double check that triple check that shit. Social media is great because it's it helps the spread of great information, but it also sucks because it helps the spread of bullshit too. So just keep that in mind. But your best bet is, is even as a solitary practitioner is to find somebody who's already versed in witchcraft that you can, that's willing to answer questions. You know, even then you have to take some things that they say with a grain of salt. You have to consistently, and this is my next point, you have to consistently be responsible. You know, you have to learn spiritual responsibility. A term that I keep using a lot um, that I haven't explained yet is closed practices. A closed practice is generally a practice that is closed to outsiders. So, in other words, not just anybody can come in and say, I am a practitioner of this. You know, you have to be initiated into said practice or you have to be welcomed to study said practice. Now, some of those examples, voodoo, santeria, Native American practices. If you're not of a particular culture or you're not welcomed into that culture to learn, you can't Learn. Because there are so many um, practices being recognized as closed and people are starting to respect that now, especially some of our younger practitioners, there's a lot of weird information going around. Because, of course, if you are a white teenager in the middle of suburbia who's just now learned and get yourself first into the craft, it can be frustrating because a lot of people are saying, nope, this is closed. Nope, this is closed. Which brings me to my frustrations. As an example, a few weeks ago, I made a video response to a video I saw on TikTok of a content creator who had a book by a particular author. I'm just not going to mention names. But particular author is initiated, for lack of a better term, into uh, New Orleans voodoo. And this book was a book for beginners for candle magic. And so because he is initiated into voodoo, he used voodoo as inspiration for writing some of the spells in this book. Hmm. This particular content creator got on TikTok and made a video of the book saying that they thought it was great and I don't want to sound upset, but it did, like this does upset me. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I do mean to sound upset. But she made a video of this book and said that it was a great read up until she got to a point where a spell flat out mentioned that it was inspired by voodoo practices. And then she said that she was upset by it because there was no warning in the book saying that it was a closed practice. Guys, I'm editing the video right now and I wanna go ahead and add more to this story. So not only did she say that she didn't think it was right that there was no warning that the book contained closed practices, but she also explicitly said in the end of the video not to purchase the book because of this. In effect, 
hurting a member of said closed culture for including his personal belief system in his writing. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was added. Here's the thing, guys. You're going to come across closed practices and closed cultures all the time. When black people with dreads come out wearing dreads and you compliment them, I like your dreads. They're not going to say, thanks, but you can't have any because you're of a particular culture or ethnic background. Hi again. I also want to add, I'm on a rant at this point, and I want to add specifically that I meant you're not going to experience that culture with a warning that it's closed. It's just etiquette that you should know and you have to be responsible to know that that's not yours so you can't touch it. You know what I mean? When you go to a Native American powwow and you buy and they're selling white sage, they're not going to say, you can't buy that because you are of a particular ethnic background. These people have to make a living too. So they're going to sell the information they know, the books that they write, the white sage that they grow themselves if they are in that culture that has a right to do so. They're going to sell their goods. They're going to sell their, their culture, which is fine if they are of that culture. You have to be spiritually responsible. You have to know yourself. And this is another reason why I say Wicca is a decent place to start. Yes, Wicca has its issues. Don't get me wrong, it really does. But the sources that I cited do not contain, to my knowledge, closed practices and are safe for anybody to pick up and, and read and adopt into their practice. Your worst fear practicing a closed practice is not to worry about necessarily a practitioner of said practice telling you that it's not a good thing, but for you to get yourself into situations that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get out of. So for example, voodoo, the spirits and the particular um, gods, if you will, uh, that voodoo practitioners work with have very specific etiquettes that you have to follow in order for you to work with them. And if you don't follow those etiquettes, you could get in trouble with that spirit. You could get hurt, you know? So yes, it can be dangerous. However, I don't think reading a spell that was inspired by voodoo out of a voodoo practitioner's book is practicing a closed practice. I think you can read the spell, but you have to be ethnically and again, spiritually responsible to recognize whether or not voodoo is a practice, is a, you know, culture that you have a right to step foot in. You can read about it all you want. In fact, I encourage you to read about multiple paths, but you can't practice all paths. You can't practice closed paths and, and claim a right to them unless you're initiated into them. And with that being said, I used white sage as an example. A lot of witches nowadays are saying not to use white sage, which personally, I think the only people who use white sage should be Native Americans. To clarify again, when I say to use, I mean as a smudging practice or as an incense. That's my personal belief. However, I also believe that it is perfectly acceptable to go to a vendor of Native American descent or culture or background or however you wanna call it 
and purchase white sage from them. White sage can be used for other things, not just smudging. You can make a tea out of it. You can make a spray and you can use white sage, but only in my opinion, if you purchase it, if you either, if you are Native American or, you know, of that culture, or if you purchase it from said culture, because money, unfortunately, is what makes the world go round. And so, unfortunately, in America, there are, I think, are more white people than POC or people of color. So if every white person were to say, okay, I'm not going to purchase books that are voodoo related or close practice related, and I'm not going to purchase anything from a close practice, then those close practices are going to lose a lot of money. Okay, yes, and yes, okay, and I'm gonna say this and it may sound wrong, but there are stupid people out there who are attempting to practice closed practices, who are buying these goods. <laughs> it's still supporting that culture and that culture needs money in order to survive in the world that we're in today or in, in order to thrive, I would say. Okay, hi again, last time, obviously. So my point, my roundabout point is that I think it's perfectly acceptable to engage in the knowledge of a closed practice if it's given by a member of that practice, if there's an exchange. So if you purchase a book with closed practices in it, or if you purchase white sage from a Native American vendor, as long as those are coming straight from said culture, that to me is a, a, and I keep saying ethnic, but I mean to say it is a ethical, <laughs> an ethical exchange. So you have to be ethically responsible, but that is an example of being ethically responsible and a good contract in a sense. You are paying for a service and you are getting that service and you can use that service. So that's how I feel. It is a contract, it's an agreement, right? So that is them willingly sharing their culture with you. With that being said, I think it's perfectly acceptable to support closed cultures. And that I think is really what I have to say for my advice video. I hope everybody got enough out of it. If not, you know, I'll put my email below. You can also comment to share anything you want or ask me questions if you want. And I'm going to leave it at that. So I hope everybody has a great weekend and blessed be.